Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Casey's Corner. I'm joined now by Kristen Ledlow, a host and reporter for NBA TV on TNT. Kristen, I feel like it hasn't been that long since I've uh, Zoomed you before. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. We've talked a couple of times in the last couple of weeks, but it's good to catch up anyway. <gasps> I know, definitely. But Kristen, just to start off, I mean, I miss basketball, fans miss basketball, but for someone whose job revolves around the game and you're constantly on different sidelines, how much do you miss basketball, especially during this time when playoffs were just going to start? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, and obviously people will be watching or listening to this at different times, but today would have been the last day of the NBA's regular season, and usually by about midnight or so, I have my first round playoff assignment, and then on a Thursday, I'm kind of packing up, getting ready to go, kind of, you know, preparing for the long stretch ahead, and typically by Friday, I'm off to whatever city I'm going to be covering a, a first round playoff series in. And now, you know, it's not that we've all slowed down, it's that we've all stopped. But I think that one of the things that the NBA and its superstars have consistently brought to the forefront of our minds is that it's bigger than basketball. And I miss it. I, I, I very much miss basketball. I miss going to games. I miss covering games. I miss the drama and, and the height of what we would have seen, especially this time of year. But I also feel really thankful to, to cover a league that I believe was at the forefront of necessary steps to take during this global pandemic. The first to kind of stop and say, you know what, this is bigger than basketball. We're going to stop. We're going to put this on hold because not only are our players our priority, but the fans who would gather in the stands, the broadcasters who would be on the sidelines or in the booth. And, and so I feel thankful in these days that there wasn't the pressure to continue solely to fulfill a role that at this point has been deemed non-essential for good reason, you know, but instead that we've had the opportunity all to come together, even as we've been, you know, physically mandated to stay apart and, and to really witness great leadership, um, to witness great generosity, um, I mean, just what I've seen from the NBA and from, you know, my network at NBA TV and TNT, and we've seen the same of others like ESPN and ABC, what I've seen of the leadership there and the generosity there and the willingness to slow down, to shut down, to put others first um, has, yes, it's made me miss basketball, but it's also put it into perspective. Yeah, I love that. It, it is more than basketball and that's something it's hard to, hard to think of right now when we all miss sports, but that's the truth of it. And we're all kind of coming together during this time. But from this season, what were some of your favorite? <laughs> that was my cat. That was <laughs> oh, that's so <laughs> cute. No, I love that. I always like every time that we're doing our podcast, you'll hear in the background, like, yeah. and it's like my cat. And I'm like, <clears throat> nothing, <laughs> nothing's Wait, going on cat. over here. Yeah. Magic. Magic. And mine's Dirk. I think I told you that last time we talked. Yes, that's very, very cute. <laughs> I love it. Um, but what were some of your favorite storylines from this season? And when you are a sideline reporter, what are the ways that you do get storylines and find out how to get stories? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, because the preparation is very different as a sideline reporter than it is for perhaps if you're calling the game play by play or if you're serving as the broadcast's analyst. Um, and I tend to... Well, I look at all different kinds of places uh, for stories to cover on our broadcasts. And I actually have notebooks full because I'm still one of the old school reporters that writes everything down. Like nothing is typed up, nothing is saved. Am I right? You know, I, I have a notebook with my handwriting full of notes that I've made at practices and shoot arounds and, and pregame and postgame conferences. And so goodness, I, I find stories in a lot of different places. Uh, social media can feed a great deal of those kinds of stories. Um, things that are said in practices, I think it's hugely important that, you know, if you are going to serve as a sideline reporter on these broadcasts to be there as often as you can. You know, I go to their practices in the mornings, um, especially when you play, cover a playoff series. You know, we're talking about the playoffs that would have been, you know, right now. Um, being there day in and day out, a lot of the stories tend to simply unfold th themselves. Um, 
but you know, a lot of that is, is the relationships that you build with the franchises, with the coaches, with the players, um, their willingness to be able to tell you stories that you want to tell. But like I said, I mean, I've got notebooks full of untold stories from the sidelines, which maybe now that there's nothing really going on, maybe I should tell a few of them, you know, or, or publish yeah. them. And so, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how many are still going to be relevant, you know, once they're no yeah. longer used in a game broadcast, but, but there's so much preparation that goes into just, you know, a few of those hits from the sidelines. Um, but I try and look, you know, for a lot of different, in a lot of different places for a lot of different kinds of stories. Um, so that no matter what goes on in the game, because the game is obviously going to dictate the broadcast that I can be ready to contribute in some capacity. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's crazy to hear so many sideline reporters um, at the network level who prepare so much for the, these games and a lot of the storylines you don't even use because, yeah. you know, because you only have a few hits. But, but you were a college athlete. I grew up playing basketball. You grew up playing basketball. So I feel like we both have that passion for basketball. But right now for you um, and your journey, how did playing, playing basketball help you now as a sports broadcaster and someone who covers basketball? Yeah. Um, you know, first and foremost, having played basketball for the entirety of my life, uh, it helps you just speak the language of the sport you're covering. You know, um, I could cover other sports because I watch other sports and because I've learned them and know them, but I don't know them the same way that I know the game of basketball because I fell in love with it from the time I was eight years old. So being able to fluidly speak speak that language, um, to be able to, to acknowledge what's going on in front of you and be able to formulate a question that can help further the story of the game that you're covering. Um, all of that plays into it. And I think absolutely, like I said, you know, I could cover other sports and I think people who, who didn't play the game of basketball could cover basketball games as well. But I think there's something unique about your perspective in the coverage of the game when it's a game that you've always played, that you've always known, and that you've always loved. It's something that certainly helped further my relationships with other players very early on, both in the NBA and in the WNBA, because there's a mutual respect that, you know, you haven't just watched this game, you know, this game, you know, and so a lot of those relationships that I formed very early on came from, from that, uh, you know, I, I was just talking to Candace, Candace Parker, who will perhaps go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest to ever play, you know, in the WNBA. Um, and she and I were, were reflecting a little bit on just where basketball has taken us. You know, it's taken her all over the world, you know, and, and everything that I have and given life is, as I've said, much bigger than basketball, but everything that I have right now stems from that love, you know, that, that was honed from the time I was a very little girl. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I credit more than I can quantify to the game of basketball. That just makes me so happy just hearing that passion come from you. It's, I, I listened to your podcast with uh, Candace Parker with Sue Bird and just yeah. that, that entire <laughs> podcast was special because all three of you loved the game so much. You all played the game and you guys talked a lot about just the future of women's basketball and where it's going and what Kobe did for the game for women's basketball. It was just really special and I, I love that segment. It was great. Yeah, no, it was really cool to get to talk to Sue because both Candace and I, before she was one of Candace's competitors, before, you know, she was an athlete that I covered on national television, we were just fans of hers. And so to like get to just hang out for a little while and talk about the game is, I mean, goodness, I, I hope I never get used to it. it you know, I, I've been doing it for a lot of years and I think at some point you think, oh yeah, it will just feel like another day at work. But like, what? No, like it, it really, it, it really never does for me. Well, I was just going to ask you, uh, I mean, you grew up, you grew up watching Shaq. You grew up watching all <laughs> these incredible NBA players that are now your colleagues and now people that you, yeah. work with. it's crazy. I mean, Candace Parker, I remember growing up, I bought her book. I loved Tennessee. I mean, yes. a phenom athlete, but what is that like? No, I, <laughs> It's funny you ask that because 
I don't even know how to like how to sum it up properly to like convey how truly cool it is to me. You know, I mean, like it just really is that cool to me. Like a few years ago, I was just psyched like to get to meet Candace Parker. Like I can't even believe that I get to meet her. I'm just such a huge fan of her. Like she's she's just the coolest. I may be overusing the word cool here, but it is just it's unbelievably so cool. cool to me, you know, that now it's like one of her actual job responsibilities to talk to me regularly is again, the coolest, oh, no. but you know, like guys like Shaq, uh, guys like Dennis Scott, you know, I have a cat named magic. I grew up an Orlando magic fan, the, the magic, you know, the very first basketball team that I really fell in love with. And so now that like, I mean, their coworkers or colleagues or whatever, you know, the coolest coworkers of all time. It just, again, I've said it before and I think I'll say it over and over and over again for years and years and years, which is like, as soon as I get used to this, like as soon as I think that this is just a very normal thing or a very normal part of my day, like it should belong to somebody else, you know, because I, I want to, I, I just want to acknowledge like over and over that this is a basketball fan's dream. And the day I stop becoming a fan, the day I stop being a fan, the day that I stop like realizing that this is, is there another word than cool that I can use? Cool. Because I just don't think, I mean, goodness, awesome. like as soon as I, yes, all of those words, yeah. as soon as I stop thinking that this is that, then somebody else should do it. Because this is every bit of that. This is every bit of growing up and falling in love with a game, everything that you hope that it's going to be on the other side. I love it. But the TNT crew is just unique and it's special and it's funny and yes. it's not a traditional broadcast. And I think that's why a lot of people resonate a lot with the TNT crew from the pregame shows um, to you on the sideline. I mean, just all the above, everyone on that broadcast has a unique personality and just, and they make it fun. They make it conversational and, I, when you watch it, you feel like they're your best friends. So yeah. I think that's something that's really special about that crew, for sure. No, I, yeah, I, I feel the same way. I remember my first day, my first night, um, actually on air on TNT, and it was to plug inside stuff. Um, we were bringing inside stuff back to NBA TV, and they were going to have me on inside the NBA to come, like, you know, talk about inside stuff. and well, to, to challenge Sha Shaquille O'Neal to a, a free throw shooting contest. And, and I'm like, what? I couldn't believe that, first of all, I was allowed in the building. Second of all, that like when I walked in, that before the cameras were rolling, when the cameras weren't, like they're exactly who you think they're going to be. Like they're exactly what they look like they're going to be when you watch them on television. And that is undoubtedly the coolest part about working on TNT is we're given the freedom to, to be entirely ourselves. Um, and those guys, I think, have, have redefined what a sports broadcast should even look like yeah. because they – never really even acknowledged when the camera started rolling, you know, like, it's just, this is who they are. This is what they would be talking about anyway. This is the way that they actually get along or don't. And you get a chance to see that. And it makes you want to welcome them into your home. It makes you want to welcome them into your living room every Thursday night or throughout the entire stretch of the playoffs. And it's everything that I hoped they were going to be when I was eventually allowed inside of the building, you know, that, that they are exactly that, you yeah. know? They're, they're so much fun. You're so much fun to watch. And also speaking of that, I, I told you last time we talked that whenever, whenever I watch you on TV, you're, you're the exact same person that I'm talking to right now. I mean, you're the same person. You have that same passion. Um, you're real. And I think that's really special as a reporter to have. It's something that I admire to have one day. Oh, you know? No, I, I really appreciate you saying that because I, I it's something that I don't think is valued everywhere. And it is absolutely that something that's valued where I work, you know, um, I think that finding your voice, especially as a young female broadcaster and very early in your career can be one of the most difficult things to do. It's why I've told you, you know, doing this, doing this podcast, you know, is going to be hugely important to, to honing your skill and finding your voice. And 
again, just one of the most difficult things I think early on is to think, I've got to be a version of this, or I've got to look something like this, or sound a little bit like this in order to be a sports broadcaster, you know, rather than thinking, I'm a sports fan, and the fact that I get to go to these games, period, is pretty cool to me, and so I want to relay that in some capacity. I, I never want to lose that. I never want to lose that. You know what? I'm just really excited to get to be here, <laughs> you know? Um, I, I'm a huge fan of, of this game or this team or this moment, and I can't believe that I get to witness it, much less cover it, and so they at TNT, I think, have given us free reign to say, like, go in as fans, you know, go in as like excited to cover this game. Don't lose that, you know? And, and I think it's, it's something that has certainly set the guys I work with apart. Um, and, and it really just, anytime I talk about it or I'm asked about it, it really just, it, it really just feels like a privilege to get to be part of. I love it. And Kristen, you are, you have been uh, help, helping mentor young broadcasters from coaching calls to uh, one on one Skyping them and talking about their real. I've been a part of many of them and it's been so valuable to me. But it's something that you don't have to do and you want to do it. And every time I'm a part of one of those coaching calls or I'm talking to you or the group of young women also in those calls, it's really special and you can tell that you really care about giving back to the younger generation of upcoming broadcasters that want to be in your shoes one day. Why, why do you do that? I appreciate you saying that. Um, I, I mean, the short answer to that question is because there were some incredible women who did that for me really early on that absolutely did not have to either. Um, women like Michelle Beadle, women like Sage Steele, women like Rachel Nichols, uh, women like Doris Burke, who is, I think, by anyone's standard, the greatest to ever do this. Um, you know, they didn't have to take the time to talk to me or encourage me either, um, and did. And, you know, I also pretty specifically remembered the ones who didn't, you know, the ones who didn't respond or didn't acknowledge me until I was in what was deemed some position of importance. And, and I never wanted to be that, you know? Um, and so again, the, sh the short answer to why is because it was done for me. Uh, but also because I feel like I've learned I'm so much more in the last now 10 years that I've been out of school, which don't do the math on, you know, how much, older I am now than I was 10 years ago, but 10 years that I've been out of school and, and I feel like I've learned so much more in the 10 years that I've been out of school and actually working in the field um, than I did in the four years that I was in school. And that's not a knock against my broadcast degree, but it absolutely, there is something to be said about the knowledge and the skill that is gained simply by doing the job over and over. And so a few years ago, I just thought, you know what, I'm going to start creating like a coaching curriculum that, that I can work with young female broadcasters on. And, and I can take the time to say like, Hey, so here's what we're going to go over for the next hour. Like, and, and here's how to build a reel that's going to stand out. And here's how to conduct an interview that's going to get you the kind of answers that, that fans want to hear, you know? And, and so I started working on that curriculum and then I kind of looked at it and it's like, all right, so, so this is looking like something that may be helpful, you know, in some capacity. And, and then I realized as I, I talked to young broadcasters who, who do typically just have that, um, you know, the education, but not necessarily the experience, perhaps the broadcast degree, but not very many years in the broadcast field yet. And so there are, you know, things that I hope I can add to, perhaps the things that you know and give you a few more tools for your toolbox to make you a little bit better at the job or help save you some of the mistakes I made early on or, you know, <laughs> but once I started working on that and I realized like, okay, these are things that I think I wish I would have known when I was younger. I'm going to, you know, put it out there and see if anybody responds. And a few of you did. And I feel thankful to, to be able to, to, you know, be able to, to impart, I can't say impart my wisdom. It's not wisdom. It's, you know, I, I know a few things. Yeah. yeah, I know a couple of things and I'm helping you know those things also. <laughs> well, it definitely works and it's been so helpful to me and so many. But I think that's really special what you said. There's definitely 
women or men who don't help you along your journey. And uh, you remember that and you remember the ones that do. And I think that's yeah. really important to remember. Um, and then I wanted to ask uh, for people that are just kind of starting out in the industry. And we've, we've talked a few times about this, but uh, that are grinding away and it's hard and it's difficult and you're carrying all your equipment and <laughs> your own camera girl and your light girl and all the above. Uh, it's, it's not easy, but it's worth it for the ones who make it out. And you were one of those people. You had to go through the grind days. You had to do the internships. You did local. Uh, you worked your way up. And I think that's, and I think that's uh, very admirable about you. Uh, what would you just say to those people who are going through that time and trying to make it and get better? I think you worded that interestingly because I certainly would have worded it the same way when I was doing it. Um, I would have said, this is worth it for the ones who make it out. Absolutely. I would have thought of it that way. Um, and probably only would have assigned those days value if I had known. On the other side of this, you get to do this, you know. But I, I don't see it that way anymore because I have gotten to do everything that I set out to do. Like anything from here on out is like, wow, that's a cherry on top of a dream that I did not know to dream big enough. I Trust me, I am so aware of that. But at the same time, I, I think that the advice I would give to those young women who are, like I did, their own camera person, their own editor, their own producer, their own writer. I mean, I, I've done all of that. I, I, I've, I've shot the football game, gone back to edit the football highlights, to put together the script, to deliver the highlight. But, I mean, to get 45 seconds of airtime in local news that seems like, what in the world am I doing with my days? Um, and I certainly would have only thought it to be worth it if this were the end result. But if I were to give any advice, it's to to lean into those days. It's, it's to enjoy every part of the journey. My biggest, and I think probably my only great career regret is that I did not enjoy the first few steps that I took. I did not, I didn't take the time to really enjoy learning, you know, to enjoy finding my voice, to enjoy formulating a, an opinion, to enjoy honing my skill in every way. I didn't enjoy the journey along the way. I was so focused on the destination that I missed those moments. I missed so many great seasons of life because I was so focused on the next one. And again, that's not only the advice I would give to the young women who were doing that now, but it's something that I think undoubtedly these days should teach all of us is that even the most certain, what we deem to be certain aspects of the lives we live and the careers we're pursuing are entirely uncertain. So like, take the time to, to actually soak in the season where you are, you know, not a season of basketball I'm referring to, I mean, a season of life, you know, and, and when you get to where you were trying to go, I think that it will make the entirety of that journey far more enjoyable than if you're only focused on where you think you're headed. Preach. <laughs> a lot of people needed to hear that. Oh, I did it the wrong way for a long time, you know, and I would have needed to hear it also. Yeah. I love that. Okay. I have some rapid fire questions. You can answer quick. Um, okay. So favorite player ever. NBA. Kobe Bryant. Best part about a basketball game or actually best part about the sport of basketball. Hmm. Yeah. It's hard to describe what I mean. It's the, it's, it's the, the movement, the feeling it's the like adrenaline kind of. Yeah. I, I think that it's one of the, if not the most beautiful sport, like to watch just the, yeah. the, the movement, the feeling, the, uh, the energy. I just, it's hard, I think, to sum up in a word yeah. and you're asking rapid fire questions. So I just it's totally kind of like butchered that one. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the feeling that I get, like the, the sport itself, I mean, it just, yeah. the, the beauty of the sport and the movement and, and the momentum, it just, I, I don't think is matched anywhere else. I love it. I totally agree. Okay. What are your favorite shoes that you own? Oh, that's a like very difficult Like question. sneakers. Yes, of course. I, 
I don't care about other shoes besides sneakers. The, the other shoes besides sneakers are just shoes you have to wear because you're told you got to look a certain way for a certain thing, but I don't care about those shoes. My favorite sneakers, it may be the Jordan collab with the Levi's brand. I have the Retro 4s, which are my favorite sneakers of all time anyway, in like that white denim. So it's like my favorite look from the 90s, all in one sneaker. That's probably got to be my favorite. I should get those for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, who is your idol? Oh, goodness. Um, I, I, you know, I hesitate to use that word, but I certainly think that the woman I look up to most in my position is Doris Burke. And it's not just because she is as excellent as she is in the role that she's in. Um, it's because she was the first and the only woman in her position for so long and still took the time to turn around to make sure that those of us behind her were equipped to continue moving forward. And I just, it's a rare rare quality. Um, and she not only possesses it, but makes sure that all of us do as well. Uh, so it's gotta be her. Um, what are you binge watching on Netflix? Okay. So you know what I just binge watched this week, but they're no longer on Netflix. And apparently they were for a long time and I missed them being on Netflix, but I had never seen I know it sounds crazy. I had never seen Harry Potter, not any of them. Okay. I haven't either. I haven't either. No, I, well, so when I was thinking like, all right, we've got like, not just like hours to fill, like weeks to fill, you know, and, and there's no basketball games to watch. There's no, well, there's no really anything, you know? And so I thought, all right, so what are some of the things that I missed out on? And I thought Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, and uh, what was the other thing? Oh, the Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. And I, in the last week, have watched every single one of the Harry Potter movies. And I know, given, I'm like, I'm not just like a year late. I'm like 20 years late to this because I believe that Harry Potter is actually my age. So like, these have been around my whole life. <laughs> um, but I cannot believe that I missed them. And if you missed them, I cannot recommend them highly enough. Okay. Like, the, I, I am still speechless. It's been three days since I finished the series, still speechless. Okay, then I need to watch it. Actually, all three of those I have not watched. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch the others now too. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll start on the others now too, but, but Harry Potter was unbelievable. Okay, good to know. I will definitely watch it. Okay, and then favorite sports movie? Space Jam. Oh, duh, and you're gonna be in the next one too. You talked about Well, that. I can neither confirm nor deny. Anything well, if that you are, heard. I'm going to be very excited. And if you're not, I'm going to be really disappointed. And I'll probably <laughs> have to <laughs> um, Favorite sports book? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I've got a couple, but I think Bill Simmons' Book of Basketball is my all-time favorite. And then Shea Serrano's Basketball and Other Things. And I'm not just saying that because he had me write an excerpt for it. He did have me write an excerpt for it. However, it's a great book regardless. Uh, and so I would recommend either one of those. Sweet. And uh, favorite quote? Or like saying or anything? No, it's a great, great question. Uh, Ernie Johnson has said to me often and says often, be a fountain, not a drain. Essentially, contribute more than you're taking and leave places better than you found them. And he is the perfect embodiment of that and challenges all of us to be that as well. And so I think that would be my favorite. That's great. Okay, and then a few fan questions just to end this. Um, what is, what's a challenge in this business that you didn't expect and how did you overcome it? <laughs> Man, I mean, a lot of the challenges that this business presents, I don't think are expected because they're not things that we're taught to expect. <laughs> I think from the outside looking in, I certainly would have thought, and I think a lot of people think, that it's a lot more glamorous than it is, that perhaps I've got a team of people that are making me look the way that I have to look on TV, when in reality, it's typically myself putting on makeup and trying to curl the back of my hair in a very dimly lit bathroom in the basement of an arena. Uh, so, you know, again, it's, it's none, but I don't think anything ever is exactly what you think it's going to be. Um, but goodness, I mean, the challenges, I, I think, just uh, 
the beauty of, uh, of fighting for something, for anything. You expect there to be, you know, a handful of obstacles along the way. Um, and I almost hesitate, especially when I'm asked by young female broadcasters, to even say them because it's like, what in the world do I have to complain about? Truly, you know, and, and you're going to figure it out along the way. You're going to figure it out in your own way. Um, but I think that, I mean, goodness, the, the, the difficulty of any challenge that has come, to my, uh, come my way in this industry, I think, cannot possibly meet the beauty of the days that I, I've experienced because of this game and because of this role. So, again, I, I don't even think it's worth, it's not worth dwelling on them. I love that. Um, and do you ever get nervous when you go on air still? And if so, oh, yeah. how do you... Yeah. Oh, no, that's a great question. Um, all the time. And, and people ask me that as well. I, I still get nervous in any role that I haven't done yet. So like, I'm very used to doing now like, hosting game time on NBA TV. Mm -hmm. The first time I hosted game time on NBA TV, I was terrified. And the same went for the several weeks that followed as I got used to doing that. The same thing for, I mean, goodness, dating back to my very first role with NBA TV was hosting Inside Stuff with Grant Hill. And I, I mean, had it, no, I was not by any means confident going into that. I just thought, well, this is awesome that they've let me in here and I get to meet Grant Hill, not thinking like, oh, this is going to be the role that I'm in seven years from now still, you know? So, so yeah, I, I still get nervous all the time. Um, I very rarely feel entirely confident. Um, a lot of it is kind of just, you know, fake it until you make it. And once you do, you, once you kind of figure like, oh, okay, now I get exactly what's going on. But yeah. no, very rarely do I step into some huge arena or, or some huge role on some huge broadcast and think, well, I've got this, you know, I, I just you don't. Never know. You would never know. <laughs> I appreciate like, you saying that because so I, I feel nervous all the time. Um, and, and I've figured out a few things that help me with that. Um, but, but no, I, I still feel nervous all the time. I, I let too often, I feel the weight of every moment. Like, and it's how I am. It's not just how I am on TV. It's how I am in life. Like mm. anything that makes me a little bit sad makes me all the way sad. Anything that makes me a little bit excited makes me way too excited. And so like sometimes I'm just acknowledging like this is the, you know, the Eastern Conference Finals and LeBron James just brought the Cavaliers back over the, and I'm the one that gets to talk to him. It's like, how do you calm down for the few no, seconds to ask him down. those three? You don't, you know? So, so yeah, I mean, I still experience all of the nerves, all of the adrenaline, um, and I don't want it to go away. I, I would like maybe to be able to harness it a little bit better, and I'm working on that, but, but no, I, I still get the nerves all the time. What, who is your favorite player to interview and why? Uh, well, I mean, speaking of LeBron, it, it, he, he's always thoughtful. He's always generous with his time. He always calls you by name, which makes you feel valued. Um, and you kind of always feel like, oh, wow, I was just part of another really special moment. Like, that's LeBron James, you know? Um, so he's, he's, he's an all-time favorite. Uh, but I also love uh, some of these younger guys now that you don't exactly know what they're going to say. Like Joel Embiid has become a favorite interview of mine. Uh, Draymond Green is a favorite interview of mine as well. Uh, I just kind of like the not knowing. Like this could go any direction and you're going to determine that. And, you know, I, I, I like guys like that who just let their personalities shine. And then last question, what is your favorite memory from your time with NBA TV? Oh, goodness. That, that is an impossible question for me to answer. Uh, like, a favorite memory of, goodness, this has been now seven years of my life. And, and so it has been longer than anything I've done in my life. You know, I wasn't in elementary school for seven years or middle school for seven years or high school or, or college or in any of the jobs that I've ever had. A seven year stretch is the longest time that I've ever consistently done anything in my 32 years on this planet. So to try and sum it up, I, I mean, goodness, or to pick a favorite moment or even as you asked about, you know, the hardest moments. I mean, it's given me, 
everything good that is in my life is, is a credit to falling in love with this game when I was a kid and just pursuing that passion as an adult. And so I, man, a favorite moment is just, I don't know that I can answer that one for you. Okay. I sincerely I apologize. No, that, that you can't <sighs> pick one. There's too many good ones. That's a good thing. Yeah. But thank you so much for joining me, Kristen. I really appreciate you and your passion. And uh, thank you for being a trailblazer for all of us. Oh, thank you for saying that. And thank you for having me. And you look, by the way, a lot better than I look a month into this quarantine. So I need to know what's going on with your hair and makeup situation because I cannot seem to look nice no matter how hard I try in these days. So <laughs> well done. <laughs> it's all my local news coverage in my living room. <laughs> Doing well my done. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you. It was great to see you. Great to talk to you. And we will talk soon. Of course. Anytime.